The first Hellfire Club was founded in 1719 A.D. in London, England by Lord Philip, Duke of Wharton, and his other high society friends, including Philip's cousin, the Earl of Hillsborough, the Earl of Litchfield, and Sir Ed O'Brien, but admitted men and women equally, unlike most contemporary clubs. The club held meetings initially at the Greyhound Tavern, but as respectable women members could not politely enter taverns, the meetings progressed to a series of members' houses in and around London and at Wharton's Writing Club. The content of their meetings, however, was meant as intentionally scandalous and thus kept necessarily as clandestine and inconspicuous as possible. The club met on Sundays, dressed as biblical characters, at their secret location for that weekend, and partook in a meal consisting of some variety of oddly named concoctions, such as Holy Ghost Pie, Breast of Venus, Devil's Loin, Hellfire Punch, and etc. The members referred to themselves as Devils, and their chief potentate as The Devil, and participated in so-called mock religious ceremonies. Following 1721 charges of horrid impieties being brought against Lord Philip by Robert Walpole under George I, whom had made Philip a duke, but ultimately bent to the political pressure applied by Philip's political opposition in order to split Philip apart from his political allies. After his club disbanded, Warden became a Freemason and, by 1722, was the Grand Master of England. Immediately following the dissolution of this foundational Hellfire Club, the movement shifted geographically north, entering Ireland, and a new phase, during which magic spread to the rakish set, causing the movement to carry, as one contemporary critic called it, a more satanic stamp than before. In London, a Hellfire Club continued to meet at the George and Vulture Inn, which was lampooned as the setting for the 1739 A.D. painting. William Hogarth's Charity in the Cellar, and an apocryphal story recorded by Thomas de Quincey persists about an unnamed lord, possibly Frederick, Prince of Wales, John Montagu, 4th Earl of Sandwich, inventor of the sandwich, and co-founder of the 1744 Devon Club with Sir Francis Dashwood, or else Sir Francis himself, roasting a man on a spit at the Georgian Vulture Inn. Imitator clubs sprang up across Ireland with chapters in Limerick and from 1735 in Dublin, where Colonel Jack St. Lager, a relative of the Honorable Elizabeth St. Lager, and Richard Parsons, first Earl of Rosse twice, 1725 and 1730, Grand Master of Ireland, founded a club with Lord Santry, Simon Luttrell, a.k.a. the Wicked Madman, and Colonels Clements, Posenby, and St. George that hosted orgies at the Eagle Tavern on Cork Hill at Daly's Club on College Green and at a hunting lodge atop Montpelier Hill until they burned it down and relocated to the Killikey Dower House, further down the same hill. At these they drank hot scalthine, a mixture of whiskey and butter laced with brimstone, and toasted to Satan. The Dublin Hellfire Club revival, called the Holy Fathers, was denounced in a March 12, 1771 issue of the Freeman's Journal, but nevertheless lasted about 30 years, toward the end of which their members included Thomas Buck Whaley, 1766-1800, son of Burnchapel Whaley, 
the reputed president of the original Dublin Hellfire Club. Edinburgh's branch arranged pacts with the devil. A branch in Oxford was still operational as lately as at least 1763, when a pamphlet attacking a clergyman named John Kedjo was published accusing him of membership in it. Another collegiate branch was established in Cambridge, where the minutes book of a so-called appalling club, consisting of seven founders calling themselves the Everlastings, from 1738, remain in possession of the Masters of Jesus College since the death of its last member on November 2nd, 1766. The remainder of the 1700s AD Hellfire-type clubs emanated from Sir Francis Dashwood and his immediate coterie of personal friends. As previously mentioned, Dashwood co-founded the 1744 Devon Club with his friend John Montague, 4th Earl of Sandwich. The aforementioned painter William Hogarth was a friend of Dashwood and was himself a founding member of the Society of Beefsteaks. Another friend of Dashwood's, anti-Catholic John Hall Stevenson, inherited Skeleton Castle, inland from Saltburn, and, renaming it Crazy Castle, he founded the so-called Demoniacs with mutual friend Joseph Stern, whom soon ceased to attend, and with Francis Dashwood as appointed privy councillor, and they met in assemblies to drink, gamble, and joke, and practiced ritualized parody baptisms of new initiates. Sir Francis Dashwood's own inevitable Hellfire Club was called the Dilettante, and established from 1732 with between 12 and 40 members, some possibly having been members of the original London Hellfire Club, orchestrated under Lord Philip of Wharton. The Dilettante were also called the Order of the Knights or Friars of St. Francis of West Wycombe. After their first meeting on Walpurgis Night, 1752, at Dashwood's family residence in West Wycombe, but from 1752, the group met twice monthly and once for a week annually in June or September in the revamped Abbey of Menmenham and changed their title to the Monks or Friars of Medmenham. Their ceremony included a dress code for the brothers to wear white leggings, jacket, and cap, and for the series of presenting abbot leaders to wear a similar ensemble in red, and their meetings included hosting mock rituals, pornographic items, much drinking, feasting, and prostitution. The abbots comprised an inner order of 13 members who, around 1757, were experiencing a rollover into a new generation of leadership. One of these members was Secretary-Treasurer Paul Whitehead, a prominent poet of Republican and atheistic leanings, whom planned their ritual ceremonies and whom once organized a procession of homeless to travesty an annual Masonic parade. John Wilkes, although never an inner circle member himself, claimed the dilettante were English Eleusinian mysteries, and even though frequently non-members and visitors, such as Horace Walpole and American spy Benjamin Franklin, were allowed to attend and later to publicly formulate their own opinions of what they saw, membership declined and Menmenham was closed down by 1766, following a scandal involving Wilkes' implication in printing The Essay on Woman, a 1755 work by Thomas Potter, resulting in Wilkes' exile. From 1760 to 65, Charles Johnstone published the satire of the events at Menmenham called Chrysal, or The Adventures of a Guinea. 
including a tale of Lord Sandwich mistaking a monkey for the devil. In 1781, the year Sir Francis Dashwood died, his nephew, Jason Alderson, founded the Phoenix Society Common Room at Brasenose College, Oxford, in Dashwood's honor, and this group has continually replenished its lineage until the present day, although only by applying its own motto, Uno Absolo Non Deficit Alter, Latin for when one is torn away, another succeeds. A saying from the sixth book of Virgil's Aeneid. Rather than Philip Wharton's original Hellfire Club's motto, Fais si que tu vaudre, French for do what thou wilt, stemming from Francois Rabelais circa 1532 fictional Ave of Thelema. The immediate result of the rampant, undisciplined hedonism seizing popular English and Irish cults of the Baroque era was the apex of decadence under Louis XVI of France that had driven France deeply into international war debts which ultimately led to the French Revolution from 1789 to 90 AD, during which, in January 1783, came the beheading by guillotine of the French king Louis XVI himself. In 1793 and 4, the Committee of Public Safety imposed a dictatorship and, during the Reign of Terror, executed between 16,000 and 40,000 French civilians as well. At this time, Donatian, Alphonse Francois, called simply Marquis de Sade, 1740-1814, was elected delegate to the National Convention. For any unfamiliar with his works, Sade is best known for his erotic writing, such as Justine and 120 Days of Sodom, satirizing the decadent and licentious lifestyles of the bourgeoisie, clergy, and aristocracy of his era. And it is from Sade's name that we derive the sexual taboo term sadism, meaning the taking of pleasure from the vicarious experiencing of another person's pain. So we can begin to see the primary theses for this work progressing. The 1700s AD Hellfire Clubs in England and Ireland were like a pan of fire, and the contemporary Illuminati of Bavaria in what would later become Germany were like a pan of water, while the Freemasons, by then already spread across the continent and the Isles, were like a breath of air to decide between them. The oldest now known of the Charters for Freemasonry is the circa 1390 A.D. Hallowell or Regius Manuscript, which itself describes a 15-point doctrine outlining an order of architects and builders originally dedicated to the art of geometry according to Euclid. From the seed idea of the Regius manuscript germinated the pollen idea of the Matthew Cook manuscript of 1450 for a purely formatted Masonic constitution. Documenting the so-called old charges and this finally blossomed forth into the 1459 Constitutions of Strasbourg manuscript wherein are all the fundamental statutes articles, and items requisite to begin the practice of this secular, craft, guild-oriented moral system. The Lodge of Edinburgh, Mary's Chapel, number one in Scotland, was established in 1598 and is thought to be the oldest Freemasonic Lodge. 
The collector for the Port of Pennsylvania, John Moore, wrote of attending Masonic lodges there as early as 1715. The first Grand Lodge, the Grand Lodge of London and Westminster, later called the Premier Grand Lodge of England, GLE, was founded on June 24, 1717, when four existing London lodges met for a joint dinner and appointed their first Grand Master, Anthony Sayer. In 1719, they elected John Theophilus Desaguliers, a clergyman and fellow of the Royal Society. Many English lodges joined this new regulatory body, which entered a period of self-publicity and expansion due largely to second and, when re-elected also fourth, Grand Master George Payne, authoring the General Regulations of a Freemason in 1721. This writing by Payne comprised the main body of a work commissioned by de Guilaire, based on Gothic constitutions he provided and edited by Presbyterian clergyman James Anderson called the Constitutions of the Freemasons for the use of the lodges in London and Westminster, published in 1723, reprinted in 1734 Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin, and translated into Dutch, 1736, German, 1741, and French, 1745. The Grand Lodge of Ireland and the Grand Lodge of Scotland were formed in 1725 and 1736, respectively. However, many lodges could not endorse changes which some lodges of the GLE, who came to be known as the Moderns, made to the ritual. For example, from 1721 to 1747, the installation of the new Grand Master was the occasion for a parade, originally on foot, but later in carriages, which resulted in many early anti-Masonic protests following the shuttering of the Hellfire Club founded by Philip, first Duke of Wharton, and his joining, or possibly founding, the anti-Masonic pro-Jacobite ancient noble order of the Gormagones. Under the first known Grand Master, or Ecumenical Volgai, Andrew Michael Ramsay of Ayr, Scotland. A few increasingly disenchanted lodges formed a rival Grand Lodge on July 17, 1751, which they called the Ancient Grand Lodge of England. The two Grand Lodges, the Premier and the Ancient, vied for supremacy until the moderns promised to return to the ancient ritual. It was briefly considered, following the American Revolutionary War, from 1765 to 1783, to implement a Grand Lodge of the United States with Virginian Lodge member and first U.S. President George Washington as the Grand Master, but this plan was generally agreed too intrusive onto the powers of the various independent state lodges. Next, Freemasonry spread to France from the 1720s, first as lodges of expatriates and exiled Jacobites, and then as distinctly French lodges, which still follow the ritual of the moderns. The Grand Loge de France, formed under the Grand Mastership of the Duke of Clermont, who exercised only nominal authority. His successor, the Duke of Orleans, reconstituted the central body as the Grand Orient de France in 1773. In 1784, an African-American named Prince Hall, with 14 other aspiring brothers who'd been turned down throughout Boston, obtained a warrant from the Premier Grand Lodge to operate initiations into African Lodge No. 459, which restyled itself the de facto Grand Lodge, African Lodge No. 1, when the Premier and Ancient Lodges finally unified on December 27, 
1813 to form the Unified Grand Lodge of England, UGLE. During this early Grand Lodge period, leading up to the Great Schism of 1877 between English and Continental European Freemasonry, particularly pitting the French moderns against the ancient and accepted rites of UGLE following the War of 1812, studious historical scholars can definitely find evidence of popular Freemasonry attempting to walk the political tightrope, bridging the proudly heretical, libertine, hellfire club scene on one end and the staunchly conservative, reformational Illuminati order on the other essentially stretched between Scylla and Charybdis. Enter into this early Grand Lodge period of Freemasonry, just at the peak of the Hellfire Club's popularity. Adam Weishaupt, 1748 to 1780s, professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt, and 1776 founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, sometimes called the Order of Perfectibilists. In 1777, Weishaupt was initiated into Freemasonry in Munich at the Lodge Theodore of Good Counsel. In 1780, Weishaupt initiated Baron von Nige into his Illuminati system, but only four years later, on April 20, 1784, Von Nige resigned. During this brief period of time, however, the group had already amassed between two and three thousand members, according to some estimates. The avowed aim of this largely covert organization was to increase the morality, virtue, and happiness of humanity across the world. Nevertheless, due to their over-secrecy, they were suppressed and legally dissolved by the Bavarian government of Karl Theodor, Elector of Bavaria, from 1784 to 8, largely at Jesuit behest. Weishaupt continued writing works such as Diogenes' Lamp following the dissolution of his order, but the premise of organizing around his expressed principles having been specifically outlawed, Weishaupt became a broken hollow shell of whom he could have been, if only things had gone only ever so slightly differently for his fate. He received the assistance of Duke Ernest II of Saxe-Gotha-Altenburg, 1745-1804, while in exile in Gotha, and wrote a series of works on Illuminism, including A Complete History of the Persecutions of the Illuminati in Bavaria, 1785, A Picture of Illuminism, 1786, An Apology for the Illuminati, 1786, and An Improved System of Illuminism, 1787, and died at an unknown age on an uncertain date to be ostensibly forgotten about by serious historians swept into what researchers call the dustbin of history, or simply the memory hole. Weishaupt's hyper-rationalism, his humorless means of conveying data, and his seemingly matter-of-fact mannerism while positing logically astounding conclusions, amount to leaving the informing philosophy of the Illuminati order stylistically high and dry, though the real genius of Weishaupt's mind was in his organizational capabilities, so he flourished in designing an efficacious, elegant, yet overwhelmingly complex system of degrees, ritual work, and knowledge lectures. Weishaupt's first innovation was to design the first diagrammatical Ponzi scheme for exponentially inflating the Illuminati's membership roster, implementing a rule of each Illuminatus minor level initiate must bring in no fewer than two new prospective candidates for Minerval level initiation. Weishaupt seems to have adopted a great many symbolic details from contemporary Freemasonic rituals into his degree system, yet he simultaneously lists 
Eight Reasons Freemasonry Cannot Improve Mankind, and Eight Reasons the Illuminati Can, in the preparatory essay of his order, and states openly therein also that the Illuminati's goal was to secretly acquire a voting majority in those lodges and attempt to either reform or dismantle them. Weishaupt encouraged a rigorously strenuous literary routine where most of an initiate's free time would be taken up with either reading assigned books and essays or writing various types of reports, ranging from book reports and summaries of news articles to detailed intelligence dossiers to be collected on other known members and any and all prospective members as well, and even private diaries of one's own inner thoughts and most embarrassing urges, in order for the secret censor of the order to know all the order's initiates' innermost strengths and weaknesses, in short, to know every member better than they knew themselves. The Illuminati of Bavaria Designed by Adam Weishaupt in around 1776, the same year as the signing of the American Colony's Declaration of Independence from British Royal Rule, was a system of nine degrees divided into four classes. The first class, of preparatory degrees, was four degrees long. The second class, or intermediary degree, was one degree alone. The third class, or class of the lesser mysteries, contained two degrees, and the final fourth class, the class of the greater mysteries, contained two degrees as well. It is not now known exactly how many of the orders two to three thousand initiates belonged to which of these classes and degrees at the time of the Illuminati's discovery in and expulsion from Bavaria around 1784. The titles and details of all nine degrees can now be more or less entirely known through the works of various Masonic scholars. The first degree was a dual role between the uninitiated novice and the initiated apart from all ceremonial procedure. The second degree was called the Academy of Illuminism, or the Brethren of Minerva, ancient Roman goddess of wisdom and guile and held in a dark room by dark of night. The third degree, Illuminatus Minor, is the final stage of the nursery class and encouraged members at this level to join and essentially to infiltrate Illuminism into Freemasonry's right proper lodges. The fourth degree, Illuminatus Major, or Scottish Novice, is the final stage of the preparatory degrees class and in its accompanying ceremony the candidate was required to draft a brief essay summarizing their own life and present it to their sponsor. It was then double checked for falsification by the order's intelligence department, the secret censor. The fifth degree, called Scottish Knight of Illuminism or Illuminatus Dirigens was the single intermediate degree and involved the candidate for progress being required to testify his belief that the superiors of Illuminism were also the unknown and lawful superiors of Freemasonry. The sixth degree, called Epopt, or Priest of Illuminism, was the first of two in the class of the Lesser Mysteries and for which the ceremony of initiation involved hoodwinking the candidate and kidnapping them via a circuitous route to a brightly lit chamber in the midst of which sits a vacant throne with the insignias of state authority on one side and the symbols of religious rulership on the other. And if they are wisely guided, they choose to become a priest of the order. In the seventh degree, second and last of the lesser mysteries, called Region or Principatus Illuminatus. The political agenda of the Illuminati was conveyed, along with a chivalric knighting ceremony. The eighth and ninth degrees, those of the class of the greater mysteries, were called Magus, or Philosopher, 
and Man King, or Rex, respectively, although their rituals remain lost to secrecy for us today.